Well, thank you, Aidan, for, for the introduction. And uh, it's really nice to see everybody attending the talk. Um, yeah, today's topic is about Socrates, uh, one of the greatest philosophers of uh, Western civilization. So, and it's great to see the, the interest that this is raising. So when we think of Socrates, we meet a somewhat enigmatic figure um, who through his life and his character has left an what I, I say irre irrazable impact on many of his contemporaries, but as well he continues still to do so. What we know of Socrates is through the writings of others, he, uh, such as Plato or Xenophon, because Socrates left us with no writings of his. And although today he's considered to be one of the greatest philosophers of the West, and one of the founders of the Western philosophy, he never saw himself as a wise man or in possession of the teachings to pass on, interestingly enough. And yet, through the power of his presence and moral character and his genuine concern for the citizens of Athens, he still, uh, he still and he will inspire many in, in their search for wisdom or philosophy. So what they say is that he was the ugliest man of Athens, but the one who had the most beautiful soul. From Plato to us today, an impact uh, in the teachings, an impact of the teachings of Socrates seems to be significant. He opens a door to a philosopher uh, to discover our own reality and the reality of the world we live in. His mother was a renowned midwife from whom um, he learned the art of giving birth, but the art of giving birth not to, to bodies, to babies, but to our consciousness. And what he did, he mastered the art of questioning, um, still today called Socratic dialogue, that would give birth to a philosophical inquiry and start a process process of removing our own ignorance in the search for that which is true, good, beautiful, and just in us, but as well in the universe. So Socrates himself didn't live in a perfect society. Quite the contrary, he lives in Athens that underwent rise and fall of social systems. There are, these are the special times for Athens. Um, at the beginning, it was governed by Pericles, uh, there was a period through which Parthenon was built and the arts, were uh, arts and science were flourishing. But there was also a time in which the new world was being rebuilt after destruction of the Persian Wars. So what we can say, it is an unstable time. It's challenging. Athens is soon going to lose the war to Sparta and the new system of oligarchy comes in place. So Socrates spends his whole life in Athens. and. Um, uh, it, and he was, at some point, named one of his wisest, its wisest citizens, because he was the one who recognized that he knows that he doesn't know anything. And it's interesting, because uh, already there we see the parallels between our life today and the life of uh, Socrates. And um, so uh, Socrates finds philosophy as a response to the time that he lives in, and as a response to the challenges that the human being is faced with in the collective that he, that, uh, that he lives in. So as we can see, although 25 centuries separate us from Socrates, his teachings are not old nor outdated. So in Socrates, what we find is someone with whom we can connect with, so much so that we can say that we discover a bit of Socrates in ourselves when we fall in love with wisdom, or a little bit. So, so to say, when our motivations become centered more around the profound questions we all have about us, about ourselves, about life, uh, when we discover in us a space for something more timeless, durable, profound, uh, or more authentic, um, where our search for truth is that what motivates our questioning. And all of us have asked ourselves the questions that every human being has. Who am I? What is the meaning of life? 
what is my role in the society as an individual? Is there more to life than what I now see? And this is, as you can understand this as an intuition of something more durable and meaningful beyond the immediacy of life. And yet some of these questions tend to get lost in the more immediate preoccupations of life. Work, house, what we earn, what others think of us, external recognition, fears, wishful thinking, and so on. You can choose your own little battles and challenges. And uh, here is the valid question. Well, uh, what happens here? Because it, perhaps because it appears to be easier to focus on the immediate needs, even though they are less important, uh, we tend to sometimes disengage, disengage from a deeper questioning, then bring us into th territory we haven't crossed yet. But this is an important point, because without accepting the unknown, the limitations of our knowledge, our ignorance, and decisively pushing the limits of our ignorance, we cannot evolve as human beings. And did Socrates himself not remind us of how important it is to be honest with ourselves, knowing that we don't know? A step that brings us a bit closer to a beautiful mystery of ourselves and life, and in touch with the dormant potential that is yet to be awakened if we choose to engage with, with the unknown dimension of life and transform. And as we're going to see, this, this image has something to do with happiness as well. And in, in this next hour, 45 minutes, perhaps we can take away some, some key ideas to help us start a process of reflection so we can better determine, perhaps, a proper place and priority of things and events in our life. So the highest objective for Socrates wasn't knowledge or understanding, it was happiness or what the ancient Greeks would call oidaimonia. And this word has a special meaning and for ancient Greeks, a special meaning for ancient Greeks, um, this concept of oidaimonia was central to a human being. So what Socrates speaks of is the voice of daimon, and in a voice that gives guidance to, to himself. So it's a voice that advises him not exactly what to do, but it always gives him advice what not to do. So in, in modern language, uh, because very few of us, if anybody actually speaks the ancient Greek, what uh, daimon can be translated into and understood as is the voice of our conscience. Uh, you can call it the higher self, um, our being, or an inner human being. So whatever terminology makes sense to you. So what, what Socrates and the ancient Greek philosophers are actually proposing and suggesting is that behind the mask or a network of our emotions, mind and body, there is a deeper aspect to ourselves of which we have an intuition, but not, we are not always able or capable to express. To help us understand this image of a dual human being, you can, uh, you can take an analogy of a Greek theater, where an actor uh, uses a mask to express a character. So what an actor does, he animates the mask in his pursuit of that character. And he th or she throughout the play can change this mask. The same analogy can be applied to, to us, uh, according to philosophies of East and West, and here in particular, more in the Western vision of the human being. So the actor within is this timeless dimension of ourselves, of our identity, the inner self, that uses the mask of our personality, which is uh, what Greeks understood under personality is the mind, psyche, and body, to act in this world and express itself. When we're connected with daimon, with our daimon, or our inner self, or the actor, we get in touch with our own mystery. It is a state of clarity and presentiment of our true yet hidden potential in its fullness. 
For an inner human being, the priority is the search for wisdom and our ability to live the timeless values that we find. That is to say, what, what, the, what we're pursuing is to gain in mental clarity, which is expressed in action, in our moral behavior. Which, as you, as you can imagine, requires a process of transformation and what we can call a purification of ourselves from our ignorance or attachments so that we can give birth to the more authentic driving force in us. Now, I would like to stop just a little bit to uh, can explain a little bit um, what is meant by moral values, because this word, justly or unjustly, uh, sometimes is perceived very negatively as something very heavy, but in reality it is not. So what, what do they suggest? Um, what they suggest is that without, or what Socrates, I'm can including now uh, also the Greek philosophers, is that without moral values, we cannot express our inner excellence as individuals. So moral values are values, like an example is justice, courage, generosity, benevolence, but there are many more examples. Um, and what we find in this concept of moral values or better set of excellence or arete in Greek is this concept of the inner excellence within every human being. And it is understood as living the certain principles commonly called timeless values of humanity. When we apply arete, we are, or virtue, or moral qualities, we are able to express our inner excellence. That is what they say. Or in different terms, what they explain is to, we are able to live a moral life. In different words, to help us understand, is to activate the inner means of our character so we can act in harmony with our thinking, with our principles, whatever they are. Without moral life, we cannot have happiness that is lasting or inner independence from the pressures of my circumstances. With a moral life, we can change our behavior for the better, learn from our experiences and not repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So as you can see, it actually isn't a heavy concept at all, but it is a process of removing our inner obst obstacles so to say, it's, it's a process of learning to overcome my inner limitations and regaining my inner perspective. And for that, I need to elevate uh, my consciousness beyond the problems of here and now and connect with something that is more essential, with timeless principles that I hold. Um, to perhaps use an example of today uh, and the situations that we are in, when we think in the, uh, about the whole circumstance that we are in that is resulting from the whole COVID situation, we can see it as a problem, definitely, but as well we can understand it as a test to our character. Because to come through this situation with serenity, we need, to, we need to develop and call upon something deeper within, our inner resilience, our patience, our courage to remain confident and serene in the face of, of the challenges that it presents. Now, we also have a choice to react with anger and frustration, passivity perhaps, but philosophically and from a human perspective, is it not better to act with calmness, with intelligence, benevolence, or with serenity? But that's, that's a part of our moral character that we yet need to activate. So what we see is that there are two opposites. So there is an internal human being, our inner self, the voice of our diamond, but there is also an external human being, our ego whose primary concern is fulfilling one's own desires, sometimes at the cost of our principles, or more often than not, really. In its search for comfort, it kills any potential of progression as a human being. Those are the moments where we want to be right, where we have a difficulty to admit a mistake, 
where we push our own agenda without consideration of consequences. So if we are not attentive inside, uh, or if we are not attentive inside, we can overlook some of these motivations that we have. But if we are attentive inside, we can discern these two voices quite clearly within ourselves. So have you ever ha been in situation or have you ever felt that you could have done something better? Better in a sense, maybe with more courage, concentration, um, attention or generosity. But uh, these simple moments are quite special because we recognize that we have the potential to do better in ethical terms, that we have a potential that we haven't used yet, put in practice, we haven't applied, because we have chosen the easy way out. So, knowingly or unknowingly, our search for happiness is what motivates all our actions. So, the most important good for us is happiness, which is behind all our actions. And um, the moment we find happiness, our search stops. Well, what it doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that we are constantly thinking of happiness in everything we do. But there is a search of fulfillment or meaning uh, where we search that our actions our decisions are fulfilling and meaningful. This, this pursuit tends to express itself um, uh, in our search for that which is pleasurable to us, for our pleasure, what we like, and we tend to avoid that which in our perception is difficult in our pursuit of happiness. However, what we also notice uh, is, is a paradox, is that the more we try to find happiness, the less we find it. And so there is a paradox, although apparently happiness is our highest good, we tend to not find it in the actions or in our life. So what we often experience is rest, restlessness or disappointment as life unfolds in un unexpected ways, that we, the ones that we didn't want to go. And like today, there is a, just to take a situation of today, there is a feeling of insecurity and our circumstances are changing rapidly and are completely outside of our control. And it is not unusual that in the face and in respect of such, uh, such challenges of life, we respond with frustration, anger, uh, fear or resignation. But have we asked ourselves why we react this way? Or do we understand what triggers this behavior in us? Mm -hmm. And this is, these are just simple questions to perhaps open a door for a different perspective, to see our experiences from a different light. Because we often think of happiness as something to be possessed, okay? Possessed as owned in that sense. Um, uh, something as a pursuit of pleasure of whatever sort. Um, and sometimes we have even this naive idea that a happy life is a life without challenges. Needless to say that there is no day in our lives that is not filled with challenges, but yet we sustain this illusion that the, the source of our happiness is the life of comfort, is the life where no challenges and no problems appear. But if we stop and think, we realize that the life without challenges is an illusion. It's something that doesn't exist. And even from our first steps as a baby, what we learn is about the bumpiness of life. For a child to start walking, he or she needs to fall. And that's the progress of life. So even from our first baby steps, we have been facing challenges. So as, as, as we can see, the life without challenges is an artificial vision of life that has very little to do with reality. But does that mean that we cannot be happy? Okay, no, quite on contrary. The happiness that Socrates speaks of is a special treasure. 
it's a state of our being that allows the human being to retain stability and balance despite all the pressures of the world. And Socrates, in the figure of Socrates, what we have is a living example of this teaching. And this teaching we find in all schools of philosophy in the classical tradition, they explain that the true source of happiness lies within ourselves, within our ability to be. The key proposition is that the happiness is related to who we are, to potential of our being, and not to what we do or what we have, which is very interesting. Now, what I say is nothing new to us. We have heard it before. But what was different to Socrates and other philosophers is that they lived the truth which they, they, they have discovered. So this teaching wasn't mere intellectual decoration, but it helped them to direct their lives with a little bit more wisdom or a little bit better. So what we can see and say is that there is an inner dimension to happiness. Uh, and maybe a better word than happiness would be serenity. Um, a serenity that goes beyond the small and large joys or worries of our daily lives. So, this lasting happiness cannot be bought for ourselves. It is the one that we can build within ourselves by building and rebuilding ourselves. And the image that Greeks used to explain this inner attitude of happiness uh, uh, is that they explained that the happiness is born at the border between the world of the gods and human beings. And gods are, gods are those who are by nature happy, and humans are those who are by nature unhappy, because they tend to fall in love with transient things of life. So, Greeks used a symbol to symbolize or to represent this threshold within ourselves. They called it the hill helicon, which uh, with, with its peak marking a border between the earth and the sky where the muses lived. So it is the highest place in us, the hill helicon within us, where life, um, where we get inspired by the timeless archetypes of humanity to give direction to our life. In this place, what we can experience is a state of openness, and you can even say universal openness, where we have courage to enter in relation with our identity, with others, with everything that surrounds us. What this inner vision allows us is to see life with the logic of inclusion, of complementarity. And this is an interesting positioning, um, uh, positioning in which we don't see life anymore as black and white, as good or bad, uh, as something that we like or don't like. But we discover life beyond these apparent contradictions and differences. So what we what we do, we take a step away from a superficial vision of, 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 of life of, from a point of view of our likes and dislikes. Because as we said, the life is full of challenges. But this also means something very positive, that it is also full of opportunities for us to learn and progress. Each challenge per se, can be seen like a test of our character and our inner ability to overcome my inner limitations. And this is more important than we think because we more often do not have this boxed, divided vision of life which gives birth to our frustrations, to our fears, to our dogmatic opinions. In reality, we reject life. It is a real challenge that we have to step outside of desires of our ego that generates a lot of suffering and therefore unhappiness. From the perspective of our inner self, what we are able is to find beauty, kindness, justice and truth in the world, in others, in ourselves, despite all its imperfections and often ugliness that we find. But this demands a different positioning, a conscious effort, an active attitude towards life.
And why can we find this beauty? Because we see a potential to change and transform above all ourselves. Because circumstances of life is difficult to change. And often we can do, we can do very little to change the circumstances that we face. But what I can determine is my inner attitude in the face of that. And to awaken this inner potential within us implies a choice to develop what um, Socrates calls a moral life. So for Socrates, the highest good is happiness, but its basis are virtues or moral qualities. And so happiness we build for ourselves, it is not something that can be given to us by the gods, by other people or things. And interestingly enough, it is independent of the circumstances of life. You can, you can imagine it like building a house. It requires a patience, it requires tenacity and perseverant effort. And where we always start is at the foundation of the house. For a house to be stable, it needs good, solid foundations. And the foundations of our happiness is in our cap capacity to live a moral life, Socrates explains. Mm -hmm. And let us take a look a little bit more at this, this aspect of our happiness and what is meant by virtue, because it's another word that sometimes can be misunderstood. Okay. So what in the, in the ancient Greek philosophies we find is that the inner self, our being, is described as virtue, but with a capital V. And the, the virtue is a genuine, um, essential feature of our identity. But this identity, the, um, our authentic self or inner being doesn't express itself either immediately nor perfectly in daily life. So to say it is not something that happens automatically. We need to build good foundations to be able to do so. So generally what we experience, we experience it in its potential because, uh, uh, because um, the inner self has to build and find its way through the labyrinth of our personality, of our ego, mind, emotions, and body, that often represent can distortion or an obstacle in order to express the most genuine aspect of ourselves. And this search for and this search of our inner self to express itself. Um, it is reflected in our search um, for, for who I am. It explains these questions, who am I? And uh, this eagerness to understand how can I express that which is deeper within me? And so what, what happens here is that we recognize that we are something else than what we seem to be. That there is something more to us. And this is a first step perhaps we can call it that way, uh, where we start leaving the cave of our ignorance and start to engage into a philosophical search. To activate this potential of our inner being, we need to build a good foundations. And um, you can imagine it is to have a good moral substance or a network of virtues because we need to build our moral ability to express the inner self. And uh, the root of the word in Greek is of, of virtue is quite interesting. And the uh, etymology of the word explains actually quite well the meaning of the word. It comes from vir, which in Greek means strength or moral strength. And so uh, our virtue, what Socrates calls the moral goods, imagine like you, you, like you have um, moral goods, the inner power of, of ourselves that we acquire by living virtuously or by practicing virtue. So to live a moral life, what it doesn't mean is that we don't enjoy other things in life. Uh, no, but uh, what we start to discover is that 
the priorities or the meaning in our life and also to start discovering that many things that are external to us are not foundation of our happiness and that's the difference okay so it's not that we are not enjoying our life no but we we have more clarity uh, on on what is the most essential to us and so and socrates in this as well acknowledges the external goods for instance that which we possess our possessions um anything and everything that is external to us our profession for instance um our social background nationality and even a family but these uh these means are secondary uh, what that means, they support our happiness, but they cannot replace oidaimonia or being one with one own self or being who, who I am. We may have all these different supporting goods at our disposal, but ultimately, if we don't use them with virtue and measure, that is to say with wisdom, they become a burden. We become dependent on it or we become a burden to others okay the true happiness cannot be lost which is why socrates insists on mastery over oneself that i become my own master and not to be mastered by desires and ambitions of my own ego so not that the other goods are not of value but the value is less than per less than perfecting our own soul mm -hmm. And the reality is, no matter what we do, there is always a moment where we are going to lose something that is external to us. Where we are going to lose a loved member of the family, uh, a friend, a partner, a job, because it's outside of our control. But what is important, despite of these losses, to not lose composure in our daily life. So what we could say is that there are two different attitudes towards life we commonly call them they can commonly be called like to have the mentality of having and to be or the mentality of being and one leads to frustration and delusions the other to virtue and freedom and there is a clear distinction between the two being is when my identity is rooted in who i am at my center beyond everything else mm -hmm. it is where we are clear who we are about our values our principles uh, it is that space where we are somewhat unshakable um, the attitude of having is when i identify with what i possess and with what i have or better said with external status symbols um, the first one is authentic the second one is artificial although it may appear shinier on the outside or more appealing initially and here i would like to stop a little bit for a moment to understand a bit more what it means to take the perspective of having instead of being because it is something that it's it's we tend to fall into this attitude if we are not innerly attentive so instinctive response of our ego is to identify with things that are external to us um, our ego by nature wants to possess them now we may say um, uh, but i don't want to possess a great house i do not want to have a car or be rich so i'm not driven by this attitude but uh, if we scratch a little bit under the surface and introspect more, we will discover another, more subtler layer to this, uh, to this tendency of our ego. So our ego t likes to possess things, uh, but not only things, also people. We love or don't love, uh, wants to possess knowledge, even life, which expresses itself in our tendency to control life and to control others. And uh, I came across a very interesting book uh, that is from um, Eric Fromm. I don't know if you are uh, familiar with this uh, quite renowned German sociologist and psychoanalyst. Um, and he dedicated the whole book to this topic, to have or to be. And it's, uh, I can recommend to, to read it. 
And so what he what he explains here is um, that this culture of possessing things is something that is quite recent phenomena in a human history. So which will um, give birth to our consumerist society and progressively to our consumerist mentality in everything we do. And so uh, he, he introduces many different examples to help us reflect and understand this attitude of having in, uh, in, in those subtle forms, like in conversations, in, uh, in love, in the way we learn, all of that, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, but uh, I, I, I chose just the two to, to help us understand a little bit more. So what, uh, what he highlights is that due to the changes in our mentality, uh, also the language, our daily language, is undergoing idiomatic changes. Quite fascinating, because what we are seeing more and more in the Western languages in the past few centuries is that we are decreasing the use of verbs and increasing the use of nouns. Now, what does that mean? It's uh, when we use nouns, we normally use the language to describe something that is external to us. It's a thing. Um, but when we use a verb, it means that we actively experience that which we uh, that which we are doing. So it's an activity. We are part of that activity. So uh, a verb would be I, I love, I think, I desire, I'm troubled. Now, what is happening? Uh, uh, what has been the change that has been happening is that we are moving more towards uh, using nouns and stepping away from to, uh, from using uh, being an active participants in our experience. So, for instance, a patient would say, "I have insomnia," but which could normally differently be said, and more accurately, "I cannot sleep." Now, this change seems very minor, but uh, what, what happens here is that we disconnect from the experience we have, which results that we don't need to do anything to change in our behavior in order to overcome a challenge that we face. Because the problem is not us, it is the thing that is external to me. Now, he also uses a different example uh, to understand this mentality of having. Um, that we tend to fall in, like he uses an example of conversations, which is quite in interesting. So when we are in this state of, uh, when we are engaged into a conversation from the perspective of having, from the perspective of our ego, what happens is we want to be heard. So that which I have to say is what matters. And the opinions that I have cannot be questioned. Why? Because they are more my possessions and they are important to me and I don't want to lose them. And you probably have experienced this scenario. Sometimes we are the instigator of this behavior. We are not always happy about that. And sometimes we are the target of this behavior by others. So if you have ever heard the expression, it's like I'm talking to a wall. It is a very simple way to describe this behavior. Now, when we engage in a conversation from the perspective of our being, which is different, okay, what we are able to do is we are able to meet another person with respect and attention. So the opinions that we both have are not that important. Uh, what we hope is to get to know the other person a little bit more, and in this process as well to discover ourselves a little bit more and to discover that which is essential to both of us whether we agree or disagree because that's that's irrelevant we are not afraid to let the false pretenses fall when we are in a state of being we are also not afraid to be questioned because it is not anymore who is right or wrong but what is good beautiful and just and so through through such a conversation both become enriched in such conversation and a little bit different mm -hmm. because we, we leave an impact on each other. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is to just keep in mind that this having mentality of our ego, you could call it the external human being, 
is a very powerful driving force within us. So we need to be attentive and progressively learn to overcome this external need and to learn how to know and master ourselves, which is also the central proposition of Socrates. So to come back to virtue, virtue is not something that we consume. And it is also not something that we use and let go. But it is something that is fundamental to our happiness and it is a part of who we are. And so it should be an objective of all our actions. Mm -hmm. Because if we possess this moral character, if we have the moral substance, we have the highest good. We are happy. Mm -hmm. Now, Socrates also gives us a key to understand a little bit more the different aspects of virtue. And what does it mean to act with virtue? And uh, he explains that the virtue has five aspects, which you can understand as a, as a blueprint on how to act in the world. Or uh, we can imagine it as a moral compass for our actions. Mm -hmm. uh, something that allows us to measure our actions and behaviors so that we can correct ourselves. Okay. So these five, uh, five aspects is, um, so firstly, our actions need to be just. So, so to say that they have the just measure, um, that they are just, uh, that they are moderate or done with moderation or in a way that they are balanced uh, or a different way to understand this in practice is to do, to not fall into excesses, okay? So to do nothing in excess. Um, the third element is, uh, of virtue is to develop love or to be able to act with love or piety. Mm -hmm. And with courage, and as you can see, both of these are to be able to open our heart to life. Which, and all of this, the practice of all of this will lead us to the fifth characteristic of virtue of our inner self, which is wisdom. And this brings us to the interesting territory. And um, in a work of mastering ourselves, in our aspiration to grow and elevate ourselves to, to be the best we can be. Now, what happens to us when we do not apply virtue? in our actions? That's also a fair question, right? What will inevitably lead is to a sort of unrest, dissatisfaction, frustration, anger, and uh, very commonly to uh, a feeling or, uh, or sense of guilt. But it's a um, Philosophically, it's quite interesting to recognize this because what it suggests is that we have tapped into recognizing our own limitation. And so understanding this is to understand that our, our inability to apply virtue is like, um, is like you're la lacking a strength. Our shortcomings, our limitations, are nothing but the shadow of a virtue that we yet have to awaken. And so this attitude of understanding that if I'm facing the inner challenges, in the face of the challenges of life, well, it, it suggests that I have a moral value, a quality to develop that will help me to overcome the challenges that I, that I face. And so this attitude paves the way to introspection and important uh, self-correction so we can perfect ourselves learning through our experience. So it's, it's interesting because when we get disappointed, um, it is often we get disappointed when we follow the call of our desire, we satisfy our desire, but in the end we don't get what we need or what we hoped for. Or when we, uh, or we get disappointed when we don't follow the voice of our consciousness, isn't it? Because we realize that we didn't do the right thing. Uh, 
or in different words, we realize that we didn't act virtuously. So we, we didn't follow the, the, the voice of our consciousness. And that's the disappointing part. Um, on the other hand, what happens to us when we do the right thing, when we admit a mistake, for instance, we feel lighter. Uh, because we have lived according to virtue and we have accepted the truth. So, as you can see, uh, in this attitude of perfecting oneself, is, is, it's very important not to fall into perfectionism. Because that's not the, the aim. It is to understand that there is a potential to us that we yet need to develop progressively, patiently, like we are building a foundation of our house. And not to expect to be perfect, because this is a desire of our ego that creates a lot of suffering. And the best remedy to overcome guilt, which, by the way, philosophically has no value, is to self-correct. It is to learn to do it better, not to let our mistake and guilt weigh us down. If I recognize mistake, we also have a responsibility to correct it. And this is uh, a philosophical challenge of life. So to, to learn to actualize my essence by overcoming the challenges of life, growing through practice of virtue. And this is, this is important because a lot of our challenges, or not a lot, all of our challenges, uh, have to do something with us. The inner, the, the inner difficulties that we face reflect itself and mirror itself in the way we approach life. So when we are faced with injustice, the reason why it is unbearable to us, it is because we face injustice that is within us. So, in order to overcome the challenges that we face and uh, find happiness, it is, it is indispensable, so to say, to develop our moral character. And our moral qualities, our virtue, have somewhat universal character. And we can say that they bring us in contact with universal consciousness. Because the practice of them gives our actions a more universal dimension. And we become a part of something universal and collective. Uh, to understand this, imagine that every time the smallest or the most unknown person stands up in front of the in injustice, he or she engenders the power of courage in its fullness. Interestingly enough, a mother that loves a child engenders or um, generates the virtue of love in its fullness. Okay. So the reason why uh, Socrates insists on self-mastery uh, is because through a long practice of virtue, we gain an ability to express ourself. Um, but for that, we, uh, there is a need of a process of forging our character to become a channel so that we, so we can express that which is the best in us. And when, when our virtue, when our moral strength is activated, uh, it expresses itself in, in our behavior, in the way we act, in the way we live. It expresses itself in what you can say in a correct behavior. Uh, when, our, when the virtue is not actualized, we cannot express my, our authentic nature. Mm -hmm. So to say, the self cannot express itself without practice of courage, of measure, etc. And so the practice of virtue is a method of freeing our authentic identity. And to understand this, perhaps more intuitively, is you can imagine that every, every one of us has a need to play the music of our inner self. But to be able to, to, to play the music of our soul, we need to learn to master the instrument of our personality. It's like playing an instrument. To overcome over the difficulties of our mind, of our emotions, of our body, to be able to, to express our higher ideals. And so it will take us time to learn to produce the right tone. At the beginning, we are going to be clumsy and perhaps uh, too harsh on the instrument that we have at hand. But with time, the idea is 
that we become virtuoso of ourselves or those who are able to to live the virtue and so the application of virtue will teach us the art of self-mastery that gives birth to our inner potential or our being by gaining the new virtues and this is this is what socrates understood as well in his role it is to accompany uh it is not to teach but to accompany someone in their in their journey of discovering themselves and giving birth to themselves and this in this journey of perfecting and transforming ourselves if we choose to do so is where we find happiness so i have spoken for quite some time uh i don't know if it was clear i hope it was and if there were any questions Was the pace okay? Were you able to, to follow? Yeah, that's perfect. Well, it must been, have been very clear because there are no questions, but uh, I don't know you, uh, if, you, if you want to ask questions, uh, please do feel free to unmute yourself and just simply speak up. Ivana, can I ask you a question? Of course. Saskia, please. Uh, because in the beginning you spoke about uh, Socrates as a beautiful soul um, in a very unstable period. I'm just wondering, was Socrates popular in his own time? That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, I... I um, okay, so Socrates left an impact on the youth of Athens and the impact on his contemporaries who were willing to question themselves and question the society they live in. Mm -hmm. So it, it was when uh, about Socrates, what we, uh, when we study his life and what we can learn from his life is that uh, one of his primary concerns was to shake the citizens of Athens out of the moral lethargy so so to 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 push uh, or assist or he was a godfly in the in of of athens as they said because he asked the questions that pushed us outside of our comfort zones and um, in order to help us to recognize our own ignorance now in this process many many uh citizens uh like plato for instance have found uh, a great advice in what Socrates had to, had to say. But uh, not everybody was willing to be tested or questioned. And not everybody was willing to face the limitations of one's own knowledge or non-existence of such. So Socrates, uh, no, he wasn't popular in that sense. He had an impact. He left no one... Um, indifferent uh, but in this process of pushing people to think for themselves he did build uh, political enemies so to say because um, uh, there were political forces people uh, who politicians who wanted to keep the status quo in athens okay. that will inevitably um, uh, inevitably result in a trial of Socrates, who was then sentenced to death by drinking poison. But this is very interesting because this process of philosopher to question the status quo um, is, is often bringing our ego into uncomfortable zone. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn to let go of this, this uh, uh, of our pride of our need to look well, um, to look knowledgeable in order to encounter philosophy. When we resist this change, a philosopher becomes a problem. So, yeah, so what the aim of philosophy is that we learn to think for ourselves, to become active protagonists and therefore less corruptible, so to say. And uh, often this is not always well taken because it puts the uh, status quo it puts the manipulation of time in question which is not necessarily what what wants to be questioned 
So I hope that that answers the question. Yes, very clear. Thank you, Ivana. Yeah. Anybody Hello, else? Hello, Ivana. Yeah, yeah. Ivana. Hi, hi, David. Please, please. Very good. Um, we enjoyed your talk. It was very good, very clear, very easy to understand, and full of impact with information. Um, I just have one, well, one question. Uh, Socrates looked at things with a state of openness in which he didn't see life as black or white, um, likes or dislikes. Well, what, from what point of view was he looking at it? Okay. So, this is what in philosophy they called oidaimonia, or um, a state of being. Okay, so to explain a little bit more, I'll, I'll use Plato's example or terminology, which is uh, Plato speaks of individual, a human being who is capable of uh, acting as one in harmony with one's own principles. Okay. So when we engage with that perspective, when we start discovering the timeless human values or archetypes like justice, generosity, um, truth, wisdom, what we start to realize is that what we like and don't like is secondary. It is not that relevant. In our pursuit of wisdom, what, uh, what we are seeking is to elevate the consciousness towards that which is good, beautiful, and just. And in this process, what inevitably happens is that we need to let go of some of um, our illusions of our ego that we have. Like, for instance, opinions. Opinions is something that we generally like, right? We also have opinions of things that we don't like. But have we ever questioned it why? Is this something that is related to anything that is just or good, etc.? So, as, as you can see, when we engage from the perspective of our principles or values, which is the purpose of philosophy to become a more ethical individual, what we are trying to understand is the life in its fullness. So it's not any more good or bad, it's what I need to learn from this. What in me do I need to awaken in order to understand this, to deal with this? And not simply to reject something just because it doesn't suit us. Yeah. Does that help, David? I would... Thanks a lot. Well, that's good. At least we had some questions. Very good. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for the questions. I'm very conscious of the time. Uh, and thank you very much for staying a little bit longer. Um, I just wanted to mention very briefly for those who are interested, because I know that we have a few new faces here, which is great. Um, we are opening a course next Thursday. Uh, it's introductory course in uh, philosophy for living. Uh, what we call uh, towards the new normal. Uh, and it's starting next Thursday, uh, as uh, Monica kindly pasted here, starting next thur Thursday at 7.30. Okay, so you're more than welcome to attend. We are going to continue uh, uh, our, it's, the purpose of the course is to open the door to philosophy, a philosophical education of the individual. And so we discover philosophy in, uh, through theoretical and practical sessions, but our focus is to uh, um, uh, to discover philosophy as a way of life, so to say. And uh, the whole course is focused around three key topics, is to ethics, which is to know myself, which is often the journey that is described in many heroic myths. Um, then in what we call a political philosophy or sociopolitics, which is to learn the art of living together in, in fraternity, in more solidarity, uh, in which each individual can give the best of oneself, but as well that we as a collective can activate the best in us. 
And the third aspect is philosophy of history, which is to fall in love with wisdom that is contained in history. It is uh, to be able to learn through time. So I don't want to take more time, uh, more time, but if you are interested in the course, you can, um, you can check out our website. And here you have as well the link, uh, um, Eventbrite link where you can subscribe, where you can register for this course. Yeah. So thank you for staying uh, a little bit longer and for all your attention. Uh, it was very good to see you and uh, we are wishing you a wonderful evening and uh, hopefully this is going to uh, give some elements for introspection and reflection.